Welcome to A Journey Through the Message. My name is Robert. And my name is Heidi. And we are so glad that you are here today. We absolutely are. Today is day number 20. We are so happy to have you along for the ride today on A Journey Through the Message. It's been an action-packed few days in the Bible lately. Oh, it absolutely has. I've got some things to say to people that say the Bible is stuffy and boring. It's anything but. We've had some action in the New Testament with the church exploding and just people learning about this new thing called the way. Oh, and yes. we've had a whole bunch of movement in the Old Testament with Joseph and him being in prison and all of this oh, stuff my going goodness. on in his we've life. We've got some murder. <laughs> we've got mayhem over here. We've got going to prison and rejoicing in it. It's there's a lot of what the world might call craziness in the Bible, but it's got a beautiful message and it's for a very specific reason. Boy, they should make a movie about the Bible or something. Pretty sure they have. <laughs> so we are going to start out with a quick prayer like always. Just get our minds and our hearts ready for what God's about to say to us and through us, hopefully. We are not people that have some fancy degree sitting on the wall or oh, anything no. like that. We're just passionate about Jesus. We're passionate about the Bible and we love sharing a little bit of that with you. He's done amazing things in both of our lives. Amen. I mean, I think we, I think I can speak for both of us and say neither one of us ever imagined years ago that we would be sitting here right now doing these things that we're doing. Complete miracle. It is, there's Complete no other miracle. word use for it so if he can use us if he can work through us if he's willing to stoop down to our level he did reach the bottom of the barrel and I the two of us out so. no matter what it is you're going through i guarantee he can take you through that as well i promise you and even better you are going to love the person you are at the end of your journey with hmm. jesus i promise you so, Father God, open up our hearts and our minds today to just be receptive to what it is you want to say to us and how you want us to hear the words that are being spoken, how you want us to interpret these words that are written on these pages, mm -hmm. and just open our hearts and minds to that. And I just pray that no matter who's listening, that there's a special little blessing in there for somebody. Oh, absolutely. I just feel so strongly that somebody is just, there's a weight and I am just I'm praying over someone I don't even know who you are, but I just pray that something in here will help release you from some of that weight and show you that there's a reason for it. And I promise God's going to show it to you in due time. Just, I'm just praying over you. Amen. So thank you, Father God, for being so good to us. We ask this all in your holy name. I pray. Amen. Amen and amen. So we are going to get started here today in Matthew, as always. Heidi's going to be starting out with mm -hmm. Matthew mm -hmm. chapter 8. And we will have the text that we're reading out of down below in the comments if you wish to follow along in your favorite translation. Or you can just let us do the hard work of reading, put us on in the background, maybe enjoy a cup of coffee or on your way into work. And we will gladly do the hard work of reading for you. Yes, and it is hard work sometimes. There, there has been some challenging days. <laughs> All right, here we go. Matthew 8, we're starting at verse 14. By this time, they were in front of Peter's house. On entering, Jesus found Peter's mother-in-law sick in bed, burning up with fever. He touched her hand, and the fever was gone. No sooner was she up on her feet than she was fixing dinner for him. I want to believe that I would have done the same thing. I'm going right now to fix you some dinner, but, and we talked about this briefly, it caught me off guard again, the reminder that Peter was married. Mm. He, I think we, or me, I'm going to speak for me, sure. often think of these as single men just going all over. They, Peter was married, has a mother-in-law, he has a home. Did the wife travel with him? Did she stay home? Did she? I have questions. I don't know if that ever gets answered. But I know. No. Anyways, continuing. That evening, a lot of demon-afflicted people were brought to him. He relieved the inwardly tormented. I like how that's phrased. Mm -hmm. Inwardly mm -hmm. tormented. Yeah. Yeah, oh. because I'm sure there were people dealing with all sorts of things oh, that we no. have names for today. That they had no clue what was going on. I mean, think about it. You're, you're talking about there wasn't even band-aids back then. 
inwardly tormented. Yeah. What a perfect description yeah. for mental illness. Oh, he cured the bodily ill. He fulfilled Isaiah's well-known revelation. He took our illnesses and he carried our diseases. When Jesus saw that a curious crowd was growing by the minute, he told his disciples to get him out of there to the other side of the lake. As they left, a religion scholar asked if he could go along. I'll go with you wherever, he said. Jesus was curt. Are you ready to rough it? We're not staying in the best inns, you know. Another follower said, Master, excuse me for a couple of days, please. I have my father's funeral to take care of. Jesus refused. First things first. Your business is life, not death. Follow me. Pursue life. Mm. That's kind of a hard statement to swallow. You know, you think of funerals. Imagine that day when it comes in. It's a family member. It's a parent or a sibling or whatever it might sure. be. Not being there for that funeral. But what a reminder, that funeral is for the people here, the living people. Yeah. It's not for that person who's gone. That person is already home. They're not here. That's why I say, I don't want any of that business. You can just throw a party and laugh about the goofball things I did, but it should be a celebrate celebration. my homecoming because, yeah. man, I'm telling you, I am living it up and excited for you all to join me. I think a celebration of life is where I like to put my mind, I guess, when it comes yes. to thinking about the end of life things. Absolutely. Like, what do I, what do I want that to look like? And I mean, that's so pretentious of us to think, well, what do I want my funeral to look like? I know, I need this <laughs> glorious box and I want these elaborate sprays of... And, and, yeah. and I really want my family to go into debt for that box that they're going to put in the group. Better go into tremendous amount of debt. I'm no, just kidding. I mean, I've, I've, stayed, I've stated plainly, I will come back and have words if you do that to me. So, oh, and then man. again, that is our, this is our opinion and our view. I don't want to judge any of you that find comfort through that. I understand there are people that see it differently and that is a comfort. We just have some different views and you know what? It's okay. And we accept anybody at our table that has a differing view. Yes, you are all welcome. Absolutely. Graciously into our home. So I'm going to jump ahead a little bit now to Acts chapter 11, and I'll be reading chapter 11, verse 19, to the end of the chapter, verse 30. Those who had been scattered by the persecution triggered by Stephen's death traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch, but they were still only speaking and dealing with their fellow Jews. Then some of the men from Cyrus and Cyrene who had come to Antioch started talking to the Greeks, giving them the message of the Master Jesus. God was pleased with what they were doing and put his stamp of approval on it. Quite a number of the Greeks believed and turned to the Master. When the church in Jerusalem got wind of this, they sent Barnabas to Antioch to check on things. As soon as he arrived, he saw that God was behind and in it all. He threw himself in with them, got behind them, urging them to stay with it for the rest of their lives. He was a good man that way, enthusiastic and confident in the Holy Spirit's ways. The community grew large and strong in the Master. Then Barnabas went on to Tarsus to look for Saul. He found him and brought him back to Antioch. They were there a whole year, meeting with the church and teaching a lot of people. It was in Antioch that the disciples were, for the first time, called Christians. Mm. It was about this time that some of the prophets came to Antioch from Jerusalem. One of them, named Agabus, stood up one day and, prompted by the Holy Spirit, warned that a severe famine was about to devastate the country. The famine eventually came during the rule of Claudius. So the disciples decided that each of them would send whatever they could to their fellow Christians in Judea to help out. They sent Barnabas and Saul to deliver the collection to the leaders in Jerusalem. How beautiful a picture that is, that their faith was so strong that he prophesied famine. They didn't wait for that famine to jump into action. They did it then and now and collected so they could take care of their fellow Christians mm. 
ahead of time. They didn't make them wait until they were hurting and suffering. Kind of like that little story in oh. Genesis with Joseph, right? Yeah. Joseph being put in charge of all the storehouses and God giving him mm -hmm. that vision, like, hey, your Grabbing. ability to interpret that dream and know, listen, this is going to happen. It, you need to prepare. That's faith. How many of us would act so deliberately mm -hmm. based on we our firm belief that God was... I'm just, I'm astounded, and I only hope someday to have half that much faith, truly. I want it all, but. Yeah. Oh. I think it grows and grows as we learn through life's experiences and we see God showing up in little You're ways right. through our, our life. I think that our faith grows and grows. It's there, it's never gonna be taken away, but I think we do go through life circumstances that mm -hmm. increase our faith and sometimes test That's our it. faith you know i've been through some pretty terrible stuff in life and right. i i felt like god was testing me you've done the same thing For probably sure. you've been through a spiritual desert and i was immediately reminded as i said that it was almost a conviction and i believe that was a god conviction mm. saying hold on <laughs> what has changed in you over the past year heidi how much faith did you have a year ago and how much faith do you have now? Because you've said yes to and jumped into a lot of things strictly because of faith. Yes, yes. So now we're going to be rewinding back to the Old Testament and Heidi's going to pick up here with Psalm number 19. 19. I'm always so excited to read the Psalms. You, the Psalms oh. have really been speaking to you. So I'm, I'm excited I to hear you know. read this one. I feel like God is just sending me, just showering me with hope and encouragement. Mm. And oh, I love it. So let's see what Psalm 19 says. So God's glory is on tour in the skies. God's craft on exhibit across the horizon Madam Day holds classes every morning. Professor Knight lectures each evening. Okay, I already love this one so much. How often do you see me all of a sudden just standing outside of our home, just looking around me, reveling in what I'm seeing? Their words aren't heard. Their voices aren't recorded. But their silence fills the earth. Unspoken truth is spoken everywhere. God makes a huge dome for the sun, a super dome. The morning sun, a new husband leaping from his honeymoon bed. The daybreaking sun, an athlete racing to the tape. That's how God's word bolts across the sky from sunrise to sunset, melting ice, scorching deserts, warming hearts to faith. The revelation of God is whole and pulls our lives together. The signposts of God are clear and point out the right road. The life maps of God are right, showing the way to joy. The directions of God are plain and easy on the eyes. God's reputation is 24 karat gold with a lifetime guarantee. Mm -hmm. Decisions of God are accurate down to the nth degree. God's word is better than a diamond, better than a diamond set between emeralds. You'll like it better than strawberries in spring, better than red, ripe strawberries. Think of those summer strawberries, fresh, picked, and warm, that sweetness. There, mm. There's nothing like those Michigan summer. There's more. God's word warns us of danger and directs us to hidden treasure. Otherwise, how will we find our way or know when we play the fool? Clean the slate, God, so we can start the day fresh. Keep me from stupid sins, from thinking I can take over your work. Then I can start this day sun-washed, scrubbed clean of the crime of sin. These are the words in my mouth. These are what I chew on and pray. Accept them when I place them on the morning altar. Oh God, my altar rock, God, priest of my altar. David didn't let you get out without crying today, did he? No. <laughs> I find such mm. beauty and hope in these Psalms. And I think it's recognizing that a man like David being brought to his knees and just devastated by his actions and what he had chosen to do in his life in the price that yeah. that cost. 
not just to him. Yeah. It cost his child his life. And to everyone around him. It yeah. cost a woman her husband yeah. in her sense of security and safety. He took that from them. Bathsheba was never the same. David raped her. Don't make it romantic or fantasize that it was a mutual thing. It wasn't. And this woman suffered and David knew he caused it. And then he took the child away from David. The way he writes that understanding of God's grace and his love and the glory of God. Oh, it's very refreshing. It's like it's a sweet water to just your soul. It's beautiful that nothing you have ever done will take God from you. And now I'll be closing out for the day with Genesis chapter 42 and 43. All Thanks right. again for joining along. I'm going to dry my tears and listen <laughs> to the Old Testament shenanigans. So. That's right. And there's plenty of them. When Jacob learned that there was food in Egypt, he said to his sons, Why do you sit around here and look at one another? I've heard that there is food in Egypt. Go down there and buy some so that we can survive and not starve to death. Ten of Joseph's brothers went down to Egypt to get food. Jacob didn't send Joseph's brother Benjamin with them. He was afraid that something bad might happen to him. What about the other ten? Was he concerned? Yeah. Oh, that's yeah. right. They weren't Rachel's yeah, kids. Yeah, they weren't so. Rachel's. Yeah. He had favorites for sure, and he wasn't afraid to <laughs> let everyone know it, including the other kids. So. So Israel's sons joined everyone else that was going to Egypt to buy food, for Canaan, too, was hit hard by the famine. Joseph was running the country. He was the one who gave out rations to all the people. When Joseph's brothers arrived, they treated him with honor, bowing to him. Joseph recognized them immediately, but treated them as strangers and spoke roughly to them. He said, where do you come from? From Canaan, they said, we've come to buy food. Joseph knew who they were, but they didn't know who he was. Joseph, remembering the dreams that he had dreamed of them, said, You're spies. You've come to look for our weak spots. No, master, they replied, we've only come to buy food. We are all the sons of the same man. We're honest men. We'd never think of spying. Oh, did they just throw out the word honest Yeah, can men? you imagine the, the roiling inside of Joseph at that point? <laughs> he said, no, you are spies. You've come to look for our weak spots. They said, there were 12 of us brothers, sons of the same father in the country of Canaan. The youngest is with our father, and one is no more. Joseph said, it's just as I said, you're spies. This is how I'll test you. As Pharaoh lives, you're not going to leave this place until your younger brother comes here. Send one of you to get your brother while the rest of you stay here in jail. We'll see if you're telling the truth or not. As Pharaoh lives, I say that you're spies. Oh. Then he threw them into jail for three days. On the third day, Joseph spoke to them. Do this and you'll live. I'm a God-fearing man. If you're as honest as you say, one of your brothers will stay here in jail while the rest of you take the food back to your hungry families. But you have to bring your youngest brother back to me, confirming the truth of your speech, and not one of you will die. They agreed. Then they started talking amongst themselves. Now we're paying for what we did to our brother. Mm -hmm. We saw how terrified he was when he was begging us for mercy. We wouldn't listen to him, and now we're the ones in trouble. I didn't stop to think of that, but absolute terror he must have had being thrown into that pit in the pleading and the crying and the mm. begging. And they just sat there and looked at him and listened to him and then walked away. Begging for mercy. And you, um, man, that yeah. just makes me. So now they, they are sitting in a my... place where they feel and they know this is how our brother felt. Oh. Reuben broke in. Didn't I tell you don't hurt the boy? But no, you wouldn't listen. And now we are paying for his murder. Joseph had been using an interpreter, so they didn't know that Joseph was understanding every word. Joseph turned away from them and cried. When he was able to speak again, he took Simeon and had him tied up, making him a prisoner of him while they all watched. Then Joseph ordered that their sacks be filled with grain that their money be put back in each sack, and that they be given rations for the road. That was all done for them. 
they loaded their food supplies on their donkeys and set off. When they stopped for the night, one of them opened his sack to get food for his donkey. There at the mouth of his bag was his money. He called out to his brothers, My money has been returned. It's right here in my bag. They were puzzled and frightened. What is God doing to us? When they got back to their father Jacob, back in the land of Canaan, they told him everything that had happened, saying, The man who runs the country spoke to us roughly and accused us of being spies. We told him we are honest men and in no way spies. There were twelve of us brothers, sons of one father, and one is gone and the youngest is with our father in Canaan. But the master of the country said, Leave one of your brothers with me. Take the food for your starving families and go. Bring your youngest brother back to me, proving that you're honest men and not spies. And then I'll give your brother back to you and you'll be free to come and go in this country. As they were emptying their food sacks, each man came on his purse of money. On seeing their money, they and their father were upset. Their father said to them, You're taking everything I've got. Joseph is gone, Simeon's gone, and now you want to take Benjamin? If you have your way, I'll be left with nothing. Reuben, meanwhile, there's a whole lot of other sons there hearing. Yeah, meanwhile, these other guys are like, Well, what about me, Dad? Like, well, there's a lot of us left, but. Reuben spoke up, I'll put my two sons in your hands as hostages. If I don't bring Benjamin back, you can kill them. Trust me. His grandchildren? His grandchildren. Yeah, go ahead and kill your grandkids. But Jacob refused. My son will not go down with you. His brother is dead, and he is all that I have left. If something bad happens to him on the road, you will put my gray, sorrowing head in the grave. The famine got worse. When they had eaten all the food they had brought back from Egypt, their father said, Go back and get some more food. Oh, their other brother, meanwhile, is... Meanwhile, still in jail. Prisoner there. Yeah. While they're going through all the food going and the famines. The... But Judah said, The man warned us most emphatically. You won't so much as see my face if you don't have your brother with you. If you're ready to release our brother to go with us, we'll go down and get you food. But if you're not ready... We aren't going. What would be the use? The man told us, you won't so much as see my face if you don't have your brother with you. Israel said, why are you making my life so difficult? Why did you ever tell the man that you had another brother? They said, the man pressed us hard, asking pointed questions about our family. Is your father alive? Do you have another brother? So we answered his questions. How did we know that he would say, bring your brother here? <laughs> Judah pushed his father Israel. Let the boy go. I'll take charge of him. Let us go and be on our way. If we don't get going, we are all going to starve to death. We and you and our children too. I'll take full responsibility for his safety. It's my life on the line for his. If I don't bring him back safe and sound, I'm the guilty one. I'll take all the blame. If we had gone ahead in the first place, instead of procrastinating like this, we could have been there and back twice over. Their father Israel gave in. If it has to be, it has to be. But do this. Stuff your packs with the finest products from the land that you can find and take them to the man as gifts. Some balm and honey, some spices and perfumes, some pistachios and almonds. You can't forget about the pistachios. Oh, yeah, just throw some nuts in yeah, there. Because... The little wonder nut. Yeah. The wonder nut. <laughs> oh, my goodness. And take plenty of money. Pay back double what was returned to your sacks. That might have been a mistake. Take your brother and get going. Go back to the man. And may the strong God give you grace in that man's eyes so that he'll send back your other brother along with Benjamin. For me, nothing's left. I've lost everything. The men took the gifts, double the money, and Benjamin. They lost no time in getting to Egypt and meeting Joseph. When Joseph saw that they had Benjamin with them, he told his house steward, Take these men into the house and make them at home. Butcher an animal and prepare a meal. These men are going to eat with me at noon. The steward did what Joseph had said and took them inside. 
but they became anxious when they were brought up into Joseph's home thinking, it's the money. He thinks that we ran off with the money on our first trip down here. And now he's got us where he wants us. He's going to turn us into slaves and confiscate our donkeys. So then they went up to Joseph's house steward and talked to him in the doorway. They said, listen, master, we came down here the other time to buy food. And on our way home, the first night, we opened our bags and found our money at the mouth of the bag, the exact amount that we had paid. We brought it all back and have plenty more to buy food with. We have no idea who put the money back in our bags. The steward said, everything is in order. Don't worry. Your God and the God of your father must have given you a bonus. I was paid in full. And with that, he presented Simeon to them. He then took them inside Joseph's house and made them comfortable, gave them water to wash their feet, and saw to feeding their donkeys. The brothers spread out their gifts as they waited for Joseph to show up at noon. They had been told that they were to have dinner with him. When Joseph got home, they presented him with their gifts they had brought and bowed respectfully before him. Joseph welcomed them and said, And your old father whom you mentioned to me, was he? Is he still alive? They said, Yes, your servant, our father, is quite well, very much alive. And they again bowed respectfully before him. Then Joseph picked out his brother Benjamin, his own mother's son. He asked, And is this your youngest brother that you told me about? Then he said, God be gracious to you, my son. Deeply moved on seeing his brother and about to burst into tears, Joseph hurried out into another room and had a good cry. Mm -hmm. Then he washed his face, got a grip on himself, and said, Let's eat. Joseph was served at his private table, the brothers off by themselves and the Egyptians off by themselves. Egyptians won't eat at the same table with Hebrews. It's repulsive to them. The brothers were seated facing Joseph, arranged in order of their age from the oldest to the youngest. They looked at one another, wide-eyed, wondering what could happen next. When their brothers' plates were served from Joseph's table, Benjamin's plate came piled high, far more so than his brothers, and the brothers feasted with Joseph, drinking freely. And friends, okay. that is the end of chapter 43. What a oh, tangled web. Much going on in that. Yeah. And Joseph, the emotions. I mean, this is his family. I'm sure he never thought he would ever see them again. Ever. And now he's being reminded with them bowing to him. Think of the emotion of him remembering the dream mm -hmm. that he had years ago that he told his father about. And he said, just as a child, like, hey, this is the dream I had. And I guarantee you in that moment that he had to run out have a good cry and just get himself oh. together, that those emotions and those memories probably came rushing back oh, to I'm him sure. in such a way. I'm sure. Where it was just completely, yeah. Yeah. We do have a couple questions. Sure. Did the brother in jail get to eat or did he that stay in That was Simeon, jail? wasn't it? Uh, yes. Okay, so he got to come out and eat. Did he come and eat? Yeah. Okay, yeah. that's good. And can we just go back to Israel just a little bit? Seriously, that man gets me so perturbed sometimes with his carrying on, his blatant, I love them so much more than I love you. And he's not afraid to tell them. He is not afraid to say it. They know that their father doesn't love them. He has no love for these other sons at all. Can you imagine a parent saying that to somebody? Like, yes. Like, yes, I can. Well, I know you can. Yes, I can. And I, I think that's why this hits me so hard, because I know what it feels like to be those other sons. Mm -hmm. I know what that feels like. Yeah. And it's just, I'm like, how can parents be that way? And I struggle because God chose Israel. Yeah. And he's horrible. He's an awful horrible human the way I hear this and is carrying on and on and on I'm gonna have nothing you have a whole bunch of sons here ten of them in fact yeah and they were willing to sacrifice your grandchildren for your beloved son 
I need to end that right there because I'm sure, I am sure God will work this out in my head. But that's why personally it can be difficult when you read the Bible, your personal experiences can come into play. I sure can. And I have to fight that. I recognize that. And that's why I talk openly about my struggles yes. when I read it. But I trust God. And this whole podcast is just about learning a little bit more about the Bible in a different way, reading through the message. This is brand new for yes. us. And it inspires little conversations. These may be verses that we normally either just brush over or maybe the sermon that week wasn't on that verse, so you right. just never read it. But these are stories that are rich with context and show just how deep God's love is for us. Oh, so, so good. And how his plan is always good. Amen to that. Amen. So friends, thanks again for joining us on this journey through the message today, number 20, and we yes. will see you very soon for number 21. That's Absolutely. habit for me. We have officially me. formed a habit. So if you've made it this far and you got to number 21, thank you for joining along. Yes. And we look forward to having you join along for the rest of the journey. We'll see you soon. Bye.